Turn your Bibles, please, to Philippians chapter 1. You know, I really expected to get a lot further than we are getting today, but we're only going through verse 14. We picked up six verses last week, so guess what? We're picking up seven verses this week. We're, we're moving on, right? As we continue here in Philippians, and this really, and I mentioned it last week as we started, this thank you letter from Paul. Now it's a letter of much more, but it's a thank you letter. And he's in prison at the time writing this letter. It's his first imprisonment. He's in Rome. And Paul is thanking them not only, but mostly, I would say, for the funds received from the Philippi church. They were so gracious. And they sent these funds there to Rome. Paul had to rent his own house. Paul had to provide for himself. And they were helping out. But there's much, much more that we will pick up in, in the uh, book of uh, Philippians. Now, we might ask, maybe you've asked, or maybe you already know, why was Paul in prison, right? Why was he? Well, we could make it real simple and just say for preaching the gospel. That's why Paul always ended up in prison, was for speaking Jesus' name. But, it, it, you know, it goes much deeper than that, what events occurred and Guys, when we studied the book of Acts some time ago, the end of Acts speaks about all the events that took place for Paul to end up in Rome in this prison where we're reading right here in Philippians, right? We're not going to recap all that, thank God. <laughs> guess, guess what? Those chapters go all the way from Acts 21 to Acts 28, which is the last chapter of the book of Acts. But all these events that led to that arrest, it began in Jerusalem. The end of his third missionary journey, and Paul came into Jerusalem, and many things happened. I'm not going to get into that. But Paul and others came, and they came to Jerusalem for a purpose. And guess what that purpose was? It was to bring funds. It was to bring these funds, this offering, to those in Jerusalem. The reason, main reason they were there was for that. That oppressed church in Jerusalem. See, much oppression was there. Much, much uh, persecution upon the church. Where they literally couldn't make a living within Jerusalem, and they knew that. And so from the church of Corinth, Paul collected these funds and brought them into Jerusalem. And then all these other took place. These Jews from Asia rose up against him, said he was defiling the temple. Guys, go back there to chapter 21 through 28 and read it for yourself. But this is why he is in prison. Now, like I say, it's recorded from 21 to 28, but it's kind of interesting. Right at the end, and we read this last week, Luke records in chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. He says, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no one forbidding him. This is where Luke stops. <laughs> Luke recorded Acts, by the way. Luke just ends right there so abruptly. Boom. There's got to be a lot more Luke that took place in this time. He just says, hey, two years he's there and he, He's sharing the gospel. No one forbidden him, right? Why did it end so abruptly? God's Holy Spirit. We have to understand the word of God has been put together also through these writers through God's Holy Spirit. Maybe God's Holy Spirit said, that's all you need, Luke. Let's leave it right there. Now, Paul's thanks to the Philippi church, guys, is much more than that. It's, it's a courage Courage. He wanted them to have courage, you see, there in Philippi. Continuing the gospel. You know, he was obviously thanking them for those funds. But his sincerity, as we're going to study on, is that they had this courage, this grit, to move on as a church. See, Paul knew the dangers they faced. Christianity was not, a, not the thing that everybody wanted to hear back then. Hmm, sound familiar today? <laughs> you know? Sound familiar today? Fact is, he knew the danger. His same actions and what he was doing, preaching the gospel, got him arrested many years earlier. By the way, from the time he got arrested in Jerusalem and then got taken down to Caesarea and on the ship and all this, years had passed by the time he got to Rome. But this love offering from Philippi, as I say, is only going to be part of Paul's thanks and his encouragement. See, Paul's true thank you. I really have to believe that these Christians, their devotion to the gospel, 
their true grit. Wasn't that a movie? True grit, you know, that they would continue on, not folding under any kind of pressure, remaining faithful to the call of Jesus that he gave them to put the gospel out there. Paul's letter here, it reflects the courage, the commitment, and like I say, the grit, you know. I don't know if they used that word then, but just a pure grit. You needed to continue, and your work will be completed, he told us. We ended in verse 6, right? If you keep the main thing, the main thing. You know, I think with churches so much times, that the main thing is the main thing. The main thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the teaching of God's word. You know, you don't want to come here and hear, hear stories from me. You know, you don't want to hear things that I think. You want to hear what God's word has to say, amen? I hope that's what you want to hear. You got to keep the main thing, the main thing, Jesus and the gospel, gospel of Jesus. You know, our confidence, their confidence then was through Jesus and him crucified. Jesus, what Jesus did upon the cross. And that third day rose again, according to the scriptures. You know, much as Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, I got some scripture I'm going to put up here. This church in Corinth. Jesus alone, keep the main thing, the main thing, the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. It'll be on the screen. And I, brethren, when I come to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. How humble he was when you think about that, writing that. Paul was a very educated man, but he says, I hate I didn't come here this way. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, the power of the cross. That is the message that still needs to go out. In verse 3, then, he writes... I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Man, there's so many persuasive words in our world today of this human wisdom. He says, no, it wasn't human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. Paul knew where his, where his call was and he knew where it came from. It came from the power of God and the God's Holy Spirit. And then he says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. Not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our witness, church, as Paul's, is always will be in the power of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. We're going to get into this morning's message. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your, for your word. Thank you for the encouragement you give us. Lord, your word is meant to change our lives, to speak to us. God, I ask again that you will bless the reading and the study of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew. So the title of my message this morning is Getting Real. Oh, we're going to get real here, guys. Getting Real. Now, we left off last week with Paul's words of confidence. I love this scripture. I use it all the time to encourage those. In verse 6, if you want to catch it there. Be confident, he said, of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Man, does that not encourage you? I sure hope it does. Individually, I could come up to you. Be confident of this. Be confident of this. You know, that should encourage us. This very thing, the main thing, the main thing. He, Jesus, right? He who has begun that good work will complete it. What is that good? What is that good work that is going, God going to do in you? Well, he's going to complete it. Whatever it is, he's going to continue on. Church, when we have confidence in Jesus and him and the power of his Holy Spirit that he says, I give you my Holy Spirit, do you realize we tap in to the power of God? The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, resurrection, is the same power that God puts in you. By the way, that Q&A last week asked me to kind of speak more about the power or the Holy Spirit. And there's some questions on that. And I'm going to try to hopefully that Q&A next week will, I'll explain it a little deeper. The power of the Holy Spirit, when you tap into that, not the wisdom of a man, you see, the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
Verse 5, Paul writes there, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. Not in men's wisdom, but in the power of God. Our faith, our confidence there, needs to be in the power of God. His word and the Holy Spirit working in us. You know, too many people, they put their faith, seriously, in this world today, they put their faith in man's wisdom. Man's knowledge, man's intellect, you know. They put it all in man. You know, we put our faith in those, all those leaders of our community. Maybe, maybe in the government. We put our faith in there. Well, I'm going to trust my government, you know, to keep me in a good place, keep me safe. I'm going to trust those, uh, put my faith in those professors in those universities and colleges because you know what? Those university professors, well, they're very intellectual. And so I can put my faith in their wisdom. <laughs> Please don't do that. Unfortunately, our, our children, you know, are being taught in these schools. I'm going to put my faith in that. I'm going to put my faith in the doctor. You know, I'm going to put my faith in what is, what do they say today? Science. I, I got to put my faith in science, you know. What was that, uh, what was that movie? That was a, you probably know it, Mark, back there. Weird Science? <laughs> Anybody watch that? Don't worry about it. You see how carnal I am. <laughs> Weird Science. They're going to put their faith in scientists. Guys, your faith always need to be in God and the power of him. You realize he's the creator of all of that I just spoke of? Literally, the government, any leaders, those wise professors. Jesus, God created them to begin with. God's divine power and sovereignty, that's what we put our faith in. Many people struggle with that word sovereignty. You know, God's in control. I know pastors that struggle with that sovereignty. Well, no, God, let's just do what we want. You realize God is still sovereign in everything. And that time will come. Put your trust, your faith in God. God's power and not man's. Amen? In Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Understand that. All things. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. That's broad, guys. All things in the end. You know, as for me, and I hope for you too, I'll put my faith in God, not in man. Amen? Okay, we're going to get into verse 7 now. This is, gets exciting here. What Paul has to speak to this church in Philippi. After he tells him to be confident... And, he, and he's telling him he's praying for him too, right? Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, he says, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the, in the defense and the confirmation, the defense, and the, we're going to come back to that, the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Now, you all are partakers with me of grace also, he says. For God is my witness. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. We're going to stop right there. It's right for me to think this, he says. It's right. I'm praying for this. I pray for this. Why was it right for him to think that of this church of Philippi? Why? They're fighting the gospel, church. They were a church they were out there. They were preaching the gospel. They were meeting. They were defending and confirming. It was a fight. Oh, there's a word you don't want to use anymore, right? Man, somebody uses the word fight. Now they think you're going to start beating them up. Hmm, you guys know what I'm talking about there, right? I hope you do. Fact of the matter is, it is that. It was a fight for them. In Romans 1.16, you know, I love this scripture, and I keep putting it up because you had to take it in to yourself. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. That is the fight. We cannot be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. These in, Phil in, in Philippi, I'll guarantee you, they were not. And he commended them for it. Paul praised that church for the defense, he says, the defense of the gospel, the confirmation of the gospel. That fight for the gospel. Now, are we really called to fight 
you know, duke it out, place blows on an unbeliever. Boom, you, you don't believe? I'll, I'll show you how to believe. Boom. Yeah. No, no, of course not. Of course not. You know, we put that word in its proper perspective. And unfortunately, other people don't. But the fact of the matter is, we're not called to fight in that way. We're called to fight with answers, church. We're called to fight with the hope. The hope of the gospel. We're called to fight with Jesus, to give a defense of the truth. You know, to defend and confirm, he says there. First Peter 3.15, I've used this scripture with you many times also. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense, an answer. An answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that's in you. Can you do that? Can you give them an answer? For the Jesus that's in you, why are you the way you are? I hope you can do that. Give it to everyone who asks you the reason for hoping you. And he says, with meekness and fear, that's with humility. Saying, I don't even deserve this. Let me share this with you, right? Our greatest weapon. You know, I, I played that uh, battle belongs to the Lord. Well, in reality, our greatest weapon and the battle we fight is the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen. The hope of the gospel and Jesus in you. Jesus in you, being seen through you. Now, Philippi, they stood. This church in Philippi, they stood with Paul. And he says they stood in that same grace, right? It says they were partakers of it. He says, you all are partakers with me of this grace. Now, Paul's in prison. He's chained to a Roman guard 24-7. He's in that prison, you know, his own house, basically. He was under house arrest, but still, he's chained. But he felt and seen every day of God's grace. And so he says that. You're particulars too with me. You know, I'm actually chained here. That grace and that peace. All those trials of life in that prison, you can only imagine, you know. Sometimes that guard might be, you know, nice, and sometimes that guard may not be nice. But the fact of the matter is he saw the grace of God and never removed that, that grace and that peace of Jesus and where he was. You know, I, I, I spoke extensively on that last week in the fact if you need peace, number one, you have to receive the grace. That's why it always says the peace and grace in the Bible, peace and grace. If you need peace in your life, there's something going on, chaotic, take the grace. Be a partaker. That's what he's telling the church here. You guys are partakers of this peace. And Paul said, I have you in my heart there also. Man, he had him in his heart. Like I say, Paul was a man of great intelligence. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the Old Testament forward and backwards, man. But guess what? Not only was a man of great intellect, he also had a great heart. Jesus gave him that heart. He didn't have it before, but he gave him this heart, the Philippi church, and the heart for them. And I'm praying for you, right? Paul even calls God as his witness of his heart. <laughs> Can you do that? Can I do that? Hey, God is my witness of the heart I have for you there. He says, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. He calls God. God knows my heart for you, you know. God knows my heart. Sharing the gospel, church. When you want to share, when you want to talk to a loved one, you want to talk to a family member, a friend, a neighbor, you got to have the heart of it, right? They'll recognize what heart is in you. He says God recognizes here. When we're sharing the gospel, it requires a heart for those people. I'm in a true heart, the heart of Jesus Christ, for them to literally know your heart. Paul says here, you know my heart, and by the way, God knows my heart. He's a witness for me there. That heart of affection. You know, that song starts right here. Ah, we'll keep our, our missions overseas. But for the hurting in our city, we won't even cross the street. You know, how many churches are that way? Well, we'll support those missionaries over in... Timbuktu, but don't ask us to walk across the street and minister to somebody there. To have the heart for the lost, the heart for the hurting, truly the heart of Jesus. 
Adam Clark phrased Paul's idea here. Quote, I call, God to, I call God to witness that I have the strongest affection for you, that I love you, and that the same kind of tender concerns with which Christ loved the world when he gave himself for it. That's what he's saying. Adam Clark said, I'm loving, that Paul's saying, I'm loving you the same way Jesus loved you when he went to that cross. That's a powerful, that's a powerful heart, guys. You know, can we have that heart of Jesus for others? You know, whether they're in this church or whether they're on the outside of this church, whether it's a family member you're speaking to or not speaking to, right? That always saddens me. It really does. And I, I understand there's a lot of reasons, guys, but in God's word, I don't believe there's any reason for family members to be at odds for years and years and years, whatever it is. Anyway, verse 9, let's move on. And then he says, in this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. Let your love, he says, abound more and more in the knowledge and all discernment. Let your love abound more and more in the knowledge and all discernment, he says, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense also till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God, he says there. Guys, I love this. I pray for you. I pray that our love will grow larger and larger abound more and more as a church. How is God going to do that work? He's going to do it through your love, through your love for others, your heart for them. This Philippi church had a lot of love, and he says, I'm a, I want you to have more. I want you to even have more there. Paul wanted to pray more and more love that they would have, but I want to make a note what he says here. Go back there, what was it, to verse 9, that you abound more and more in the knowledge and also discernment, too, in this love. This love needed to have knowledge and discernment, not a blind love. I'm going to go into that. Not some kind of blind love. A love, then, that he says will approve things that are excellent. Not just some blind love. It needed to be godly love. It needed to be the right kind of love. See, Paul knew the danger of undiscerning love. He says, you got to have discernment. You have to have knowledge and discernment with this. He knew the danger of this undiscerning love, the undiscerning love. Anything goes, you know. Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul, by the way, the letters to the church in Corinth, they aren't as beautiful and loving as the one to Philippi because they had some corrections that needed to be done. And we're going to see a major rebuke that Paul throws at them about, hey, you got, you don't not using the knowledge and the discernment in your love. It needs to be proved with excellent. You know, this idea of the undiscerning love and anything goes, we all just kumbaya. Right? Let's just all kumbaya. Maybe we can sit around a fireplace and sing it even. Huh? Kumbaya together. Overlooking sin and turning a blind eye. That's what Paul's going to speak about here in Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 1. There's some exclamation marks in there. I like those in the Bible, man. Because the fact of the matter is, this is Paul. A little upset. And he says in verse 1, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is as is not even named among the Gentiles. Oh, that's saying something. Among all those other people out there, the non-believers, this sexual immorality, you've topped them. That a man has his father's wife, he goes, exclamation mark, and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. He's talking to the whole church here. For I indeed, as absent in, my, in body, but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present, it says there, him who has so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver that one, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, he says. For glorying is not, for glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? I'm going to go back and explain some of this. If you don't know this scripture, a little leaven, he says, leaven a whole lump. You know, my mom used to make bread when I was a kid. And I never had store-bought bread, that rainbow sliced bread, until I was like 12 years old. Always wanted it, didn't realize how good her bread was, you know. But she'd make this bread in a big roaster pan. Because there were a lot of kids, 10 kids, right? And every week she'd make that bread. And, of course, that yeast in there, the leaven. Right? She put that yeast in there, and that thing would rise up in that roaster pan like this, and she'd punch it back down. So that's what leaven is, in case you do not know. He says, a uh, little leaven leavens a whole lump. Therefore, purge. Man, that's a strong word. He says, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump then, since you truly are leaven for indeed. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So Paul, he rebukes him right here. This is a rebuke. And basically what he was speaking to Philippi was to have this knowledge and discernment and approve of those things that were right. Having a discerning of love, right? Corinth's love was rebuked. Don't let love be allow sin. The others in the church were allowing this to take place, you see. They were just letting this go and, oh, you know, out of our love. Oh, we just love everyone. They're allowing sin there. Don't uh, uh, let a little leaven leaven in a whole leaven the whole lump. A little leaven leavens a whole lump, he says. It destroys it, right? Whew. Okay, here's where I'm going. We always have to be careful. Churches today base their church on acceptance Right? Just acceptance and acceptance of sin and acceptance of sin within the body, literally promoting sin too, on the premise of love. We love everybody. It's okay. There's a church in Prescott, the banner out there, the gay flag. It says, God is still speaking. No, He's not. He has spoken about that sin. Not only that, other areas of that church. Well, they had a Black Lives Matter banner up there for a while, too. The fact of the matter is, it's all in love, right? We're going to overlook all this, promoting sin, ignoring God's knowledge of God's word. He says the knowledge and the discernment. Ignoring the God's word and the knowledge of that, and then the discernment of God's word. Accepting sin as proof of the love of a church. No, that's not it, guys. That's not it. I wrote down here baloney. Not very many times I write baloney. But the fact is, that is baloney. You know, those uh, churches, they're promoting the homosexual union, the uh, uh, fornicating, fornicating of couples, right? Well, they're just living together, you know. In God's eyes, they're married. No, they're not. I'm sorry, they're not. They're promoting it, saying, well, we just love everybody here. Man, they can have somebody in adultery. Well, you know what? She's been separated from her husband for two years now. That's okay. <laughs> no, that's called adultery still. She does not have a divorce. There's a problem here, you see. That relationship, all under the premise, all under the premise, they will, of love. Paul says, no, purge it, purge it. Now, I want, you to t I want to tell you and be very straight with you, okay? Does this mean that your pastor does not love the homosexual? No. I care for him deeply. I know just like any other sin, that is a sin that needs to be repented. Does your, does your pastor have a hatred for those couples that are sleeping together and fornicating? No. Not at all. In fact, I hope they come in here and hear the word of God or they catch it online. God can fix their heart and they say, we've got to get right with the Lord. I don't have a hatred towards them. But the fact of the matter is, I cannot approve of it, right? Neither can God. It's okay to be that way. It's not a love 
that is excellent when you do. You, we need to discern what is right. You know, I, I often pray, guys, that, you know what, God will bring a homosexual couple within our body here. Let God's word do the job. Please, don't, 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 don't do this to them. Don't do that. You know, they, trust me, if God's word doesn't do the job, they will become so uncomfortable that they'll leave. But many, many in these situations have repented and turned their lives. It's no different than any other sin, guys. It's the sin of the flesh, amen? <clears throat> to approve as excellent, to discern as right. See, Paul's desire for this Philippi church was the knowledge and discernment of what that love would be. It needed to be excellent. Paul's prayer for those, and really my prayer for you, have the knowledge of God's word and the discernment of God's word. Please, work on that. That's what those Bible studies are about, by the way. You come to those Bible studies and you get greater knowledge and God will give you greater discernment too in his word. I know we're all sinners. You know that. This man standing right here is a sinner just like everybody else. But the fact of the matter is we cannot turn a blind eye we need to minister to it and not allow a little leaven to leaven in a whole lump because it can. It can destroy. In verse 10 here, going back to Philippians, that you may approve the things that are excellent, Paul says. He's praying this, that you may approve the things that are excellent and that you may be sincere and without offense, he says, till the day of Christ. Approving those things that are excellent and being sincere about it. Becoming sincere, guys. And what would we call our inner righteousness? This is God's word. I'm sincere about God's word. It's our inner righteousness. Now, we have no righteousness of our own. It comes by the blood of Christ. But that's that sincerity, you see. Now, without offense, he speaks here is more of our outer righteousness. What other people see? You know, how are you when you leave here? You know, on Monday, can the church on Monday be the church on Sunday? Can we be that? You know, well, that, is your, that is your outer righteousness, without offense. Being sincere, he says, and without offense. In verse 11, he says, being then filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. You see that? Those fruits of righteousness come from God, that you don't drum them up, you don't bake them up in an oven, you know. You can't mix up fruits of righteousness. They come from Jesus Christ there. To the glory and praise of God, he says there. Filled with those fruits of righteousness. Sincere, without offense. Those fruits of righteousness. Sincere, without offense. Like I say, God's work in us. Jesus' work. Those are those fruits of righteousness. Fruit of the Holy Spirit. Turn your Bibles, please, to Galatians chapter 5, if you would, please. Paul writes in Galatians and speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. And he speaks about the things of the flesh. And we're going to read about the things of the flesh first, okay? <laughs> Maybe we line up with that. See, that fruit of the Spirit happens. It happens. Uh, when we, well, it happens by God. That's how it happens. It happens by God. Not, uh, becomes his fruit and not our fruit. Not the fruit, fruit of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, as we read. And I say then, he says, would you walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now he's going to get a little more into this walk. But if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, less, the, the flesh, it lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. Yes, we know that. We know that in our own lives. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led now by the spirit, you are not under the law, he says. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And boy, we got a big old list here. And maybe you fell into this at one time. Maybe you were part of this list at one time. Thank God for the blood of Christ, amen? Thank God for him. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions and heresies, envies and murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the times past, that those who practice such things, guys, we're all sinners, right? We could have fallen in here for a short time. Practice means live a lifestyle. This is your lifestyle, he says. Or those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's your lifestyle. What you've done is refuse to repent. When you refuse to repent of a sin that's within your lifestyle and turn from that sin, yeah, don't expect to inherit the kingdom of God. What do you expect? You're living a lifestyle. Do you understand? So anyway, but it's okay. That's why the blood of Christ is there. You understand? It's to wash us clean and bring us to repentance. But he says, but the fruit of the Spirit now is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Man, those are good words. I love those words, don't you? That's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, he says there. Gentleness, self-control. Oh, man, that's a big one. A Christian needs that self-control in everything in their lives. They need self-control. Self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, then he writes, let us also walk in the, in the Spirit. God's Holy Spirit produces this fruit he's speaking about right here. That's God's work in us, and it approves, that Holy Spirit approves the excellence that Paul says here. To be sincere, to be sincere with God, without offense to God. All those things abound more and more in love, right? Having the knowledge, he told, spoke about that, the knowledge of God's word, the discernment of truth, period. No matter what the outside world, the internet, the radio, the commentator, whomever it is speaks, no. Having and discerning truth, all by what, as Paul says, all by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's where it comes from. Now, Paul now, he's going to explain his present circumstance. He's going to explain this circumstance he's in, in prison, obviously. And Paul's in, imprisonment had not hindered one bit the preaching of the gospel of Christ. It had not hindered his ministry at all, as he says here. In verse 12, he tells him there, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, and there's a lot of stuff happened to him before he got to that prison, but it's like these things that happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. <laughs> Imagine that. Turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident. Well, we're going to look at this here. It's become evident to the whole palace guard. These Roman soldiers. It's become evident to them. And to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Man, what a witness it was. Even to the palace guard. How big was the palace guard? I don't know. But I'll guarantee you there were probably quite a few of them. And they were responsible for being one at a time chained to Paul. It's become evident to them and all the rest that my chains are in Christ, he says. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains too. Those other ones, they've been confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear, he says. They become much more bold. Wow. You know, throughout history, guys, throughout history, persecution of the Christians, the persecution of the church has always forward, furthered the gospel. Everywhere we look in history, when there was grace, huge persecution coming upon the church, the church grew. And it got louder, by the way. It got louder, too. God uses persecution for his glory, and Paul's saying it right here. It hasn't, it hasn't you know, stopped anything. 
You know, he, he did it then and he still does it now, today, within the church. God uses that persecution. Paul said it is evident to the whole palace guard, those who were Gentiles, non-believer, those Roman soldiers, you see. They're looking at him and they're going, wow, this dude's getting real, right? He's getting real for Jesus Christ. They're witnessing that within him. Nothing stops him. It is evident to them, he even says there, right? Even in prison, even in prison, Paul furthered the gospel where he was. You know, I was reading an article, and up in Canada, there's a Baptist preacher. Canada, you know, there are friends and everything, but the, Canada doesn't have the Constitution we have, and they sure ain't got the First Amendment in Canada. But anyway, he's, uh, he's like a lot of pastors. He's preaching the Word of God, despite what the government's saying. And he allowed people to come in. Those who chose to come to church, he left. He's in prison right now. And guess what? They got him in solitary confinement. Man, did somebody read that thing where, you know, solitary confinement? Well, now he can't even preach to the other prisoners, can he? Hmm. He's praying. I, I wish I knew the man's name. I'll find it for you. But anyway, up in Canada, he said it's very evident. Even in prison, he's furthering the gospel. You know, other churches Paul wrote letters to, too, during this time. From his chains, he wrote to Ephesians, the Ephe church in Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. He wrote to the church in uh, uh, Colossae, in Colossians. He wrote to a person by the name of Philemon. He wrote there, and of course, Philippians. He was a busy man these years. He's in there. He's still furthering the gospel. Guys, all that seems bad is not always, right? Looks pretty bad for Paul. He's in prison. All that seems bad is not. Jesus' name was being furthered during this time. All that seems bad is not through our land, through our wonderful land, America. All that seems bad is not. Jesus is being preached. And his name is going out loud in many, many areas. You know, I can't tell another pastor what to do by any means. But the fact of closing the doors on the church is not the way to do it. All this online stuff, I think some of them are comfortable there now. You know, I don't know. That's not the way to do it. I'm proud to be a Calvary Chapel. There's many Calvary Chapels that, number one, this nuisance, Right? That nuisance over there? <laughs> that nuisance over there in California? They defied. No. There's one particular one. Uh, Mike McClure. Um, what's, uh, what's his father's name? Don McClure. Don McClure was a pastor from way back with Chuck Smith. Mike McClure's church over in San Jose Calvary Chapel literally is over a million dollars in fines right now. And they talked about arresting him and throwing him in jail. And let me tell you what, this man's not backing up. That's where we need to stand. See, all that seems bad is not through our land. Jesus needs to be preached. Preach. Through all the political turmoil, and this is going to go a little political, okay? Give me grace, please. Because, see, the church needs to start right here and right now. We've always, people say, well, the church was never called into politics. Baloney. I'll use that again. All through the word of God. You know, these prophets before, they affected the government. They affected the kings. You know, we can, we can make differences in our community. You know, when's the last time somebody ran for the school board? Right? Just a simple school board. When's the last time you, 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 know, you, you put in your, your hat for something you know, minor like that, affected at the minor, minor level. Uh, city councils, you know. I'm going to run for the mayor of Wilhoyt. <laughs> I don't know if we have a mayor here, but... <laughs> you know, I was talking to somebody a while back, and they're... Uh, I shouldn't even say this, but anyway. Uh, Dennis Dowling, who's the judge down in... in uh, down there in um, Yarnell, yeah. He's the local JP, and... And because my name's Dennis, 
And he's talking to his mom. He said, oh, no, no, you need to start talking around. Well, he's the judge. I said, no, I'm the pastor at the church. And, she, and he's going, and you're not the judge? I said, no, that's a different dentist. He says, I was wondering that church and state thing, you know. But anyway, let's move on. See, all that seems bad is not through our land, guys. Through all this political turmoil we're seeing, through all the liberal agenda, through all the cancel culture. We know those words. That's a whole new vocabulary we got going. That cancel culture. Jesus' gospel needs to go out more and more powerful, amen? And it is. And it will continue to do so. It needs to be furthered. You know, sometimes those Christians are just like, oh, man, be of good cheer. You know, cheerio, be of good cheer. All is not lost. Jesus is still on the throne. He's never left the throne. You know, in John 16, verse 33, Jesus says there, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. These things are going to come. And all that's bad, or seems bad, is not. In the world you will have tribulation, but he tells us to be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You think that quit? <laughs> you think Jesus quit? No. Do we believe that? I hope we do. And if you believe that, he's overcome the world, we need to live it. And obviously, be of good cheer. Right? Nobody wants to listen to or Talk to a negative nanny, you know? No cheer in their life. Be of good cheer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, Paul speaks from his chains. He's speaking about that. Let's go back to Philippians here. And he says, and, and uh, as he speaks from his chains, it says, And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become now confident in my chains, are much more bold now to speak the word without fear. He speaks about his chains here are literally a catalyst. They're a catalyst. His persecutions is a catalyst for those to step out, get real, be getting real, you know, and be bold. He says this is what's taking place. You know, when the, when the, we need to get real. Speaking boldly with no fear. The truth of God's word. When the world tries to silence us, and it's doing a darn good job in areas, right? The high-tech companies, your Twitter, and your whatever those things are, those other ones. Uh, even in YouTube. Someday they're going to silence me on YouTube. Go for it. Go for it. I'll find another platform. I don't know what it'll be, but find something else. When the world tries to silence us, cancel us, stop the Christian voice, right? They're trying to do that. The church becomes emboldened. And he says right here, those are getting emboldened by what's taking place to Paul. Make more noise as the body of Christ. We must never let our voice be hidden, church. And I stand alongside those other pastors out there, whether they're Calvary or not. I stand beside those arm in arm saying, yeah, preach the word and put it out there. Preach the word, right? Don't be scared to speak about political things. As I said, we are called as Christians to influence the world in any, any area of the world. And guess what? Politics is part of that. Many are stepping up. I think California, they're, they're going to they're gonna recall that dude, and I really believe there's going to be a conservative put in there. There's people... You think nobody cares about California, you know? Nobody cares about them. They go, oh, California. Well, you know what? That's a beautiful country over there at one time. With beautiful, beautiful people. And there's Christian brothers and sisters. And I got a heart for California. Do I like some other politics? No. I'm not going to approve of that. But when they try to silence and cancel us, the Christian voice, we need to be emboldened even more and make more noise. We must never let our voice be here. Uh, be hidden, right? We need to speak up. And we need to support those who are doing that. Who are, support them. Who those ones out there speaking louder, right? Now, I was looking him up this morning, and, and uh, 
you know, Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy, right? Oh man, they have silenced that dude. The, the, the stores are silent, big corporations. Oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. If you ever read his book, which I haven't, I think Faye has it if you want to borrow it. But it's about his, his testimony in Jesus Christ and how God brought him out. Of, he was a drug addict, he was a heroin addict, and Jesus found him just like he found me, man. Mike Lindale, go buy a my pillow. Maybe you wanted some of those Giza dream sheets. Okay, Mike, I, I put it on there for you. Now, do I get my royalties? Uh, man, but they're shutting him up, you know? Others, there are these conservative voices out there. We need to support those and encourage those who speak louder. And as we do that, those ones are out there. I mean, they're in the front of the battle, you know? The battle belongs to the Lord, and they're right up there with them. Stop supporting the enemy. What do I mean by that? Stop supporting the enemy. Research it a little bit, guys. You know, there's good stuff there. You know, you can find it online. Those who are counseling, Bed Bath & Beyond. I will not go to Bed Bath & Beyond. J.C. Penney's. Oh, they're long gone out of Prescott anyway. I will not go to J.C. Penney's. More and more and more. They've canceled my pillow of all things. They're going to cancel this man. There's all these stores. When you see that, quit supporting the enemy. Do not shop there, right? Don't support them. Cancel your membership. You know, months ago, Netflix, of all those things, people pressure them, do not show this show, Cuties. It's basically glorifying these little girls and dancing with these sexual moves and everything. And they're saying, and they would not not show that show. They stood up. Well, I canceled my Netflix, and millions of other people did too. That wakes them up, guys. That wakes them up. Don't support it. Go offline. You know, don't be there. If the entire Christian church, oh, this might hit you where you live. If the entire Christian church across America would go off Facebook, we put this man on his knees where he belongs. We shut him down right away. Am I telling you to go off Facebook? You discover it for yourself. Well, maybe that's what needs to be preached. Don't support the enemy in whatever fashion it. Well, I love my Facebook. Yeah, you know what? They're canceling people. They're canceling the conservative voice right and left. I told you it was going to get a little political. Bear with me here. You know, you got a phone. Go ahead and use that. Maybe that's better anyway. A little personal communication with somebody. I don't know. Versus this Facebook and all that. Buy local. You know, we last, was it last week? We had our, our pancake breakfast, and we needed some good kitchen supplies. There is a fantastic restaurant supply in Prescott. I was drooling like I was in the, you know, like I was in the tool aisle of Home Depot. Man, I won't let you go in there, Kathy. This stuff is just amazing they have. We bought chafing trays, if you know what those are, and they were only a couple dollars more than I could have got them on Amazon, right? Quit supporting the enemy, Amazon. Excuse me. To hell with Amazon. <laughs> Seriously, guys, don't you think there's other places to, or, to order from than Amazon? I've been caught up in Amazon. I'm like their favorite cup. Well, they got free shipping. Okay, pay a little more. Okay, pay a little more. Go find it locally. This isn't me. I believe this is God. I'm not telling you to you know, quit buying from Amazon necessarily. You decide. How are we going to stand up? up here. We need to be bold in our sphere of influence. In those areas, now we can make a difference, man. We can shut them down so quick. Everybody drop your Twitter. Everybody drop your Facebook. That dude be crawling around on his knees going, well, I was a multi, multi-billionaire. And all of a sudden, I'm broke. And all those companies with him would be broke too, you see. Standing, uniting. Hmm. You know, our president today said this, but he doesn't even understand what it means. We're in a battle for the soul of our nation. He said that. We are in a battle for the soul of our nation. He just doesn't know what the soul is. The soul is Jesus Christ. The soul is the gospel. The soul is the word of God, the founders of it. 
the life and our liberty in Jesus. You know, there's a, a quote. Some give it to Thomas Jefferson. After my research, I heard it was Edmund Burke. It says, it'll be on the screen here. All that is necessary for the forces of evil to triumph is for enough good men and women to do nothing. All that it takes is for enough good Christians, well, I'm just going to sit back and do nothing. Now, isn't that what the word of God tells us? No, it doesn't tell us that. It tells us stand up, be recognized. You don't have to be violent about it, guys. I, get, I look kind of violent and upset sometimes. Trust me, I'm not. Hmm. We as the true church are overcomers. You understand that? In all ways. Revelations 12, 11. And they overcame him, Satan, the world, the things of the world, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. They did not love their lives to the death. Mm. Is the reason we don't stand. Is the reason the church I'm talking the church, the true church, those blood-washed, born-again Christians, is the reason we don't stand. We aren't sincere. We don't discern. Aren't bold in our chains, right? It's because we quit being overcomers, right? Is that the reason why we quit becoming overcomers? Because why? Well, we love our lives too much. Man, I just love my life. I'm not willing to sacrifice anything. I live in the United States of America, and I got a good life. Is that why we're not discerning? Why we're not being bold in our chains? We just love our life. Hey, pastor, don't rock my boat, man. You know, don't rock my boat here. I like my non-bold life. It's a good place to live. I like it here. Oh, yes, and by the way, I do love Jesus. I don't doubt that in anyone who is. I don't doubt that a bit. Are we ready to prove it? Are we really ready to stand up and prove how much we love the Lord? We need, are we ready to be getting real, as that title says there? Matthew 16, 24 through 27. Jesus tells us, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself. You love your life too much? Try a little denying sometime and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Verse 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What profit is it to our nation, America, if we gain everything and we lose the soul of it? Jesus Christ. God within our country, right? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What has the church been given away in exchange for the soul of our country? We need to stand up. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works, it says there. Jesus tells us that. Are you, as a Christian, are you ready for that day? I'm not questioning your faith. I'm not questioning your belief in Jesus. I'm not questioning the fact that you are born again and blood washed. And if you're not, at the end of the service, you're going to have an opportunity to be, okay? I'm not questioning that. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day when we stand before Christ? As Christians, are we ready in all things? 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear, it says, before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done. What are our works? What's he done, whether good or bad? Well, you know, but Jesus, you know, he's standing for Jesus then. He says, hey, good to have you here. You believe. You're washed by the blood. Now I'm going to talk to you about those things. You didn't, didn't do, right? But Jesus, my comfort was more important. My comfort in life, sincerely, Jesus, I was sincere in the fact my comfort's more important. I do love you, Jesus. You're standing there speaking, I love you. But I like this world also, God, and I sure like all the other stuff. I like it also. 
Guys, it's time to decide, I believe, for the church. And many pastors are preaching this message. Not this particular message, what God puts on their heart. But the same thing. It's time for the church to stand up. To decide who we will follow. We're going to follow man. We're going to follow the, those people out there. Or we're going to follow and yet be getting real and follow Jesus Christ. You need to make that decision. Hmm. You know, I want to share a scripture here with you, and you don't have it there, but sorry about that, Jesse. Sometimes it just happens. Jesus speaking to the churches, and if you were here when we were studying Revelation, and right in the beginning of Revelation, Jesus speaks to the seven churches. He says, write this to the angel of these churches. In Revelation chapter 3, he speaks to the Laodiceans those church there. In verse 14, and he says, And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write these things, says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of creation of God, Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying there. Write these things, he says. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot, he says. I know you worship. As a church, you're not even cold. You're not hot. I wish you were. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Blah! I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you, you don't have any heat in you. And you're, and you're, and see, if you're cold, Jesus can do the work. right? Jesus can heat a church up. When you're lukewarm, you're just content. You're complacent. You're apathetic to everything out there. And he says there, because you say, I, I am rich and I have wealth and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Whew, let's pray. If everybody just close their eyes and bow their heads, please. Uh, if, you wanna, if you want it in your own heart, Church, you need to make your own decision. If you want to commit in a more powerful way, stand alongside those. just want you to pray this. And the Lord's already brought me here. Pray, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Jesus, for not standing for you. Lord, for not having the commitment, for not having the discernment, the knowledge. Lord, forgive me for those things, Jesus. Lord, I know that you died upon that cross and you gave me life for a purpose. And that's to be confident that my works would go out there. And so, Lord, I ask for your forgiveness. And, Lord, I commit my life in a greater way to you today. I'm going to give you more, Lord. Please help me by the power of your Holy Spirit. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, or you're out there online and you don't know Jesus, I just want you to pray this way. Say, Lord Jesus... I believe, I believe in you, God, and I believe that, Jesus, you died upon a cross, that you were, came to life again, risen on the third day according to the scriptures, and that, Jesus, you are my Savior, that you gave your life for me. I confess my sin to you, Lord. I confess that I'm in need of a Savior. Lord Jesus, I just ask you into my life. Lord, help me to be strong in you. Fill me with your spirit. Give me, a, give me a heart for all those out there. and Give me a heart especially for you and your word, Lord, that I would have the knowledge and discernment, the power of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you said that prayer, either one of those, uh, we'll have some prayer people up here afterwards. And uh, if you're out there online and maybe uh, you've been encouraged or maybe discouraged, I don't know which way it went, all right? I just, I just pray that uh, you, st you do and stand in Jesus. And if you just gave your life to the Lord out there, find a good Bible teaching church. Go find one with the great coffee in the lobby and that kind of stuff. Find a good Bible teaching church, amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, again, we thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, give you our lives. Lord, this life is way too short. For us to be that church of Laodicea, Lord. God, we cannot be lukewarm. We need to be hot. We need to be moving on for you. In all ways, in everything of our influence. Lord Jesus, bless us please. In Jesus' name, amen.